our second on to our second uh, talk for the day. Allow me to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Ruth Sabrina Binti Safari. Dr. Sabrina is an uh, emergency physician from Hospital Raja Permaisuri Pino Ipo. She obtained her master's in uh, master in emergency medicine from UKM in 2013. She did further her studies of special interest in clinical toxicology in Hong Kong Poison Information Center, United Christian Hospital in uh, Kowloon, Hong Kong. She holds the position of the president of the Malaysian Society on Toxinology since 2021. Dr. Sabrina is one of the panel experts manning our Remote and Innovation Consultancy Services or RECS WhatsApp group. Whenever we have cases of envenomation, such as snake bites, she's there to guide us through the clinical management of the patients, starting from the identification of the snake species. Today, she'll be sharing with us on CNS manifestation in snake envenomation. Dr. Sabrina, the floor is yours. Okay, Assalamualaikum and uh, very good uh, morning to all of the participants for the webinar for today. I enjoyed actually uh, listening to Dr. Um, apa, Suhailan's talk just now. Um, so let me continue with the next um, topic uh, that was given to me by Nasrina somehow last year, end of last year, which are the CNS manifestation in snake and venomation. If we want to talk about uh, snake bites per se, it will be around a uh, one day talk uh, from A to Z. But uh, for today, I think we will just cover from uh, apa ni, uh, regarding one uh, topic. But having said that, actually, uh, we also must know uh, that um, to learn about the CNS manifestation, we must have the basic knowledge of the um, snake and venomation, particularly in Malaysia. Okay. All right. So, uh, in my presentation, I will divide it into two parts. Number one, part one is about um, explaining about uh, what is venom and poison. And we will look at the epidemiology and statistics of snake bites, uh, particularly in Malaysia. And we will have a look of uh, what are the snake of medical significant species or groups that we have in Malaysia, the venom effect and the relation with the signs and symptoms. Um, and also when clucking a, uh, a patient that comes in uh, with a snake bite or with suspected snake bites, what uh, we have to ask in the history examination and arriving at the diagnosis and the management. And part two, it will be more specific regarding the snakes that can cause neurotoxicity, right? So uh, when we talk about venom and poison, um, so we do not actually uh, uh, in, uh, use it interchangeably. For example, uh, venomous snakes, uh, we call it as poisonous snakes um, as a whole, right? So uh, what is venom? Venom is a toxin that is present in a specialized gland that is delivered by an apparatus. So um, venom uh, can also contain in other uh, snakes, uh, for example, it also contains in bees and other animals as well. So uh, when we talk about snakes, the venom uh, is contained in a, a specialized venom gland and uh, it, was it is delivered uh, to the human or to other um, living organism uh, through their fang, right? So, and the animal itself generally uh, can be eaten, okay? And when we talk about poison, uh, it is a toxin that is present inside an organism. And if uh, we ingest uh, that organism, it can cause devastating effect. And the toxins, uh, uh, the poisonous organism, basically the toxins can be present on the skin, on the, um, gen in the genitalia, in the row, uh, in the fleshes, and etc. So all is about uh, toxin. So what have we learned so far with regard to snake bites? Uh, particularly is that um, snake bites uh, in 2009 only been recognized as a neglected tropical disease. Um, before that, only God knows actually what happens. Uh, it is uh, so fortunate if 
uh, the snake bite is uh, regarded as neglected tropical disease so that uh, from 2009 onwards, uh, a lot of actually efforts has been done uh, to actually target uh, so that the snake bites can, uh, management of snake bites can be improved in uh, so many ways, right? So uh, snake bites, particularly in Malaysia, is a common occupational hazard uh, for the farmers, plantation workers and others uh, in a few geographical locations, I would say, right? And it has resulted in thousands of death every year and many cases of chronic physical handicap. Our mortality rates uh, in Malaysia with regard to snake bites uh, stands at 0 0.2 per 100,000 population per year. This is the data that I have uh, from our Malaysian National Poison Centers uh, from 2006 until 2020. Um, uh, there are uh, uh, many, um, people who had been uh, bitten by snakes actually previously can uh, uh, be consulted or uh, the healthcare worker can consult our National Poison Center. Uh, for inquiries uh, regarding the IDs and etc. But uh, starting from 2015, 2016, uh, so, so the inquiries actually changed uh, to the Rex uh, team. Uh, so that's, uh, if you look at the database, uh, so it is actually very small in amount, although uh, we see that the snake is the very common natural toxin poisoning of venoming uh, encounters uh, in Malaysia. So the second one would be the bacteria, fungi, algae, and etc. Okay. This is one of the study uh, done uh, by uh, students in uh, University Kebangsaan Malaysia under uh, Professor, Associate Professor Dr. Ahmad Khadu Ismail, uh, whereby this is uh, the initial one, we analyzed the data analysis of a snake bite and related injuries in Malaysia consulted to rights. So uh, from 2015 onwards, uh, actually the cases that have been consulted to Rex actually is increasing. So uh, at the current moment uh, for 2022, I believe uh, the consultation is actually goes beyond 1,000 for overall uh, consultation um, uh, and snake bite actually uh, is the most cases consulted uh, to us, right? And um, uh, in these studies, three-year studies, um, states like Pahang, Sabah, Sarawak, and Perak actually is the most uh, common uh, consult, uh, most commonly consultation comes from these states. And uh, when we see the demographic data, uh, male actually is much more uh, cases that we encountered. Uh, and Malaysian is the majority of the cases that we have encountered with common age group of 21 to 30 years old. And uh, the relation in terms of occupational injury is about 25%. And when we look into the snake family, um, because uh, today is about uh, CNS manifestation of snake bites, so we can see that uh, uh, for EDPDA per se, uh, the common uh, culprit or common snake species that have been bitten uh, our patients, majority is Naja Sumatrana, followed by Kautia, uh, Ophiophagus Hana, and etc. Okay, in order for us to know a bit about the management of snake bites as a whole, so we must know uh, a bit about the snakes of, of medical significance in Malaysia. So uh, we have got snake families, okay? And uh, what I did was to divide the snake families into uh, three uh, that is venomous and the others uh, as non-venomous. Venomous and non-venomous is uh, with relation to the human. Okay, for the snake families of Viperidae, Okay. Uh, in Malaysia, we only have a pit vipers and not the true vipers. Okay, so we have got the green pits uh, and its complexes, uh, and also the brown pit vipers that is present uh, at the uh, on the ground. Okay, so we also have got uh, elapidae uh, snake groups, and um, inside this elapidae snake groups, uh, we uh, group it uh, together the crates or ular katang tebu uh, in Malay, ular katang lah ya, yeah. uh, and uh, 
ada uh, the other groups are cobras. So for cobras, uh, there are uh, three types of cobras: uh, Naja Sumatrana, Naja Kautia, and also King Cobras. Okay, or Ophiophagus hana. And uh, for coral snakes or Ula uh, batu karang, so uh, it's also another types of snakes under Elapidae groups. Although it is a coral snake, but it is actually a uh, land snake species and uh, not present at the coral reef. Okay, this is a uh, most important MCQ question and etc. So other uh, things uh, is a uh, sea snakes. Okay. So all sea snakes, uh, my new is actually uh, venomous, okay? Uh, at least uh, in Malaysia and all over the world. So in the Natricidae group, we have got uh, red neck killbacks. Uh, but with regards to our experience managing cases uh, remotely in Malaysia, we have never encountered a confirmed red neck killback uh, bite uh, uh, before, if I'm not mistaken. But um, if there is, uh, then it will, uh, we should be actually uh, uh, taking uh, really serious because the antivenom that can cross neutralize with the red neck killback, uh, uh, we might need to uh, get help from the uh, our Japanese colleague uh, because uh, the antivenom is only available over there. Okay, and um, for the uh, snake families of Phytonidae, uh, Phytons are uh, our famous uh, Phyton reticularis. So uh, it is non venomous, but it can cause a significant injury uh, to human when it either bites us or uh, when it strangulates us. Okay? So the patient might have a hypoxia or severe local tissue damages uh, because of the uh, beaten or strangulation by the Pythons and other snake families uh, in the colubridae groups are uh, generally non venomous. However, uh, there are a few snake species that can cause a bit uh, mild to moderate uh, local signs and symptoms, but um, to be treated symptomatically, and there's no anti venom for it. Okay, our land snake of uh, uh, medical significance in Malaysia can be present uh, boreally, maksudnya di atas dahan. Uh, for example, for green, green pit vipers, terrestrial, uh, maksudnya di atas uh, tanah. For example, the cobras, the crates, the coral snakes, and also brown pit vipers. And also bawah tanah, subfossorial. For example, the coral snakes. Yeah? And uh, bear in mind, we also have uh, uh, sea snakes. And all sea snakes are uh, venomous. Okay. Um, when a patient comes to our emergency department, um, uh, apa ni, we should treat as other uh, chief complaint as well. But uh, the other additional things that we need to uh, be very uh, cautious is uh, we have to uh, dig in detail into the history of what, when, who, where, why, and how uh, does uh, the patient being bitten by the uh, snakes because uh, it uh, to a toxicologist or to the senior experts, uh, the information uh, is very valuable uh, to to actually uh, to actually uh, narrow down the provisional diagnosis. For example, in an unidentified patient, uh, unidentified snake bite uh, cases, right? And if let's say the patient comes uh, home, uh, comes to us. Uh, so if the patient actually done something at home uh, or uh, something had been done at GP or clinic Satan or at the alternative healer such as BOMO and etc. So we must ask uh, what are the uh, action that been done, whether uh, there's any first aid or any other things being done because first aid also can be um, inappropriate first aid or pro appropriate first aid. Okay? And with regards to the snakes, uh, we must ask whether uh, the patient or the eyewitness or the relative or anybody saw uh, the snakes or not. Uh, is it confirmed? Uh, what is the color, the position of the snakes uh, when it bitten the patient? Whether the snakes actually slid away or stay still? Because this is a most key, uh, upon it, uh, key information, especially in the northern area of uh, Peninsula Malaysia. 
uh, especially for our Malaysia, Malayan pit viper or Calosella smarodostoma. And uh, whether the patient took the picture or killed the snake, unfortunately, or caught the alive snakes. Because we have got a few cases that actually um, the culprit of the snakes was being brought together with the patient to the hospital alive. Okay. So, recognition of the species of snake is responsible for the bite is very important for optimal clinical management. Uh, previously, uh, because we do not have the appropriate um, medical knowledge with regards to managing snake, bite, uh, snake bites, where the management is uh, like a turun temurun kind of thing. So, uh, when a patient actually brings the snakes, maybe it doesn't ring a bell to us that we need to at least know uh, what are the species of the snakes or at least actually ask if we do not know, right? But uh, currently, if let's say the patient, uh, you have the you you have the orang kata uh, peluang untuk patient to bawa the snake species, uh, so uh, you must actually ask the your senior or the clinical toxicologist um, to at least uh, identify the species, and at the same time you must be very careful to resuscitate the patient also, okay, to no harm to the patient. So recognition is very important uh, for optimal clinical management. At this, this may be achieved by number one to identify the alive or dead snakes. Number two, so if the patient do not bring the specimens, whether the patient taken any good clinical, uh, good pictures of the snakes, and number three, if the patient uh, do not uh, have the specimens, do not have the pictures, whether they they can describe uh, the snake's characteristics, okay, and uh, you may use a land, uh, uh, land snake of image gallery that we have in Malaysia, uh, currently is in third edition already. Uh, to uh, show to the patient and uh, the patient can actually choose uh, what are the uh, possible snakes that can be turned, be turned him or her. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that is not a 100% confirmation. means that if the patient cannot identify from the uh, lens snake image gallery, it might either means that uh, patient might not uh, look uh, into the snakes properly or uh, number two, the patient might be bitten by a non-venomous snake that is not available in the book. Okay, or if uh, everything else tak boleh juga, so uh, then uh, we should infer uh, the patient's uh, signs and symptoms, uh, make it into a syndromes in order for us to further manage the patients in the emergency department and in the ward. Okay, this is the the simplified chart um, that I made uh, with regards to the venom effect of our uh, snake uh, in Malaysia, right? So this is really uh, humbly said, um, uh, it is a very simplified version, but in order for us to learn, uh, we must learn somewhere and we must uh, know how to simplify things, but not to oversimplify things. Uh, okay, so as I said just now, for the snake of medical significance, we have got Viperidae, Elapidae, and also Nitricidae. Nitricidae generally cause coagulopathy. Um, uh, Viperidae generally cause uh, cytotoxicity and also hematotoxicity. And for the Elapidae, generally, uh, they can cause uh, neurotoxicity with plus either one or two of other toxicity. For example, for cobras, the additional, uh, besides the neurotoxicity, is having uh, a pretty venom effect of uh, local science symptoms, or we call it as cytotoxicity, uh, plus minus the cardiotoxicity. And uh, for example, the traits, the predominant one would be a neurotoxicity. For sea snakes, uh, it has the additional myotoxicity. Uh, so the patient can present it with a CNS manifestation and also a rhabdomyolysis at the same time. Um, and also for coral snakes, uh, there will be a bit of neurotoxicity and also myotoxicity uh, as well. Uh, but uh, the signs and symptoms is usually mild to moderate or probably uh, no symptoms at all, right? So generally uh, speaking, for uh, venom effects for our snakes uh, in Malaysia, uh, we can categorize into five. Lah. Cyto, neurotoxicity, cardiotoxicity, myotoxicity, and also hematotoxicity. So when we know about the venom effect, Roughly, as a doctor, we can actually uh, presume or uh, um, um, predict what are the signs and symptoms that the patient can present to us. For example, in cytotoxicity, because it is toxic to the 
um, tissue cells, it can cause uh, severe pain, inflammation, swelling, and also tender over the uh, affected uh, lymph node of the affected limbs and etc. Okay, so uh, when we look at the uh, bite side, uh, it may have a one marks, one bite marks, two bite marks. One bite marks doesn't mean that it is not a uh, snake bite. Okay, so for neurotoxicity, uh, so it is toxic to our uh, nerve cells. So basically, uh, the action of neurotoxicity at, is at the neuromuscular junction. So the post and pres are actually uh, with reference to the uh, post NMJ and also pre synaptic NMJ. Okay, uh, and the predominantly action of the uh, neurotoxicity. So for cardiotoxicity, the patient might present it to us uh, in either hyper or hypotension or arrhythmias. Okay, uh, the common that we see uh, when we do ECG for patients normally uh, described is uh, having a premature ventricular contraction uh, by ECG. Okay, for myotoxicity, uh, it is toxic to our um, uh, muscle cells and patient can describe or uh, tell us that he's having a, a muscle pain over the uh, muscle bulk region. Okay, and with hematotoxicity, as I said, we do not have the true vipers here in Malaysia unless somebody actually imported it from overseas, the exotic one. Um, uh, for hematotoxicity, normally uh, what we face uh, when we con uh, when we've, we've been consulted is that uh, if the patient becomes early, the if uh, the uh, uh, things that we can see over the times in the ward is that derangement of the INR and also uh, platelet dysfunction, uh, thrombocytopenia. Uh, but having said that, a few of the cases that is presented late to the emergency department also uh, lately is uh, common. Okay, uh, so if the patient presented, uh, say, uh, confirmed, bitten by a malignant pit viper, but presented to the emergency department uh, in day two, day three, so you might actually find, uh, found that actually patient have the uh, dependent hematomas um, over the dependent areas of the affected limbs as well, or even non-affected limb, okay? Okay, so... Um, Previously, uh, the diagnosis that been made for patients being bitten by a snake bite is still a leash snake bite. So uh, I think uh, we have to bear in mind that a leash snake bite is not a diagnosis anymore. If we want to make a diagnosis of snake bite, it's either uh, four of these, uh, whether it is identified, unidentified snake bite, unidentified animal injury, or unidentified injury. For the management of treatment, uh, it starts from the uh, primary healthcare facilities uh, and assessing and treating the airway, breathing and circulation takes a paramount important. And after that, actually assessing the patient's GCS level uh, and also pupillary response. And after we have stabilized the airway, breathing, circulation and disability, uh, we can actually check the uh, beaten site and also uh, do a physical examination uh, with regards to the system as well. So some of the cases actually might come to emergency department uh, as walk-in. Uh, some may actually come to the emergency department uh, through a 999 call, ambulance call. Uh, so... Uh, uh, they might come uh, with application of first aid treatment being done before. So the correct first aid treatment uh, aim is to retard the systemic absorption and preserve life prevent complication. And the um, tight arterial tonique are no longer recommended. Uh, this is uh, true with the level readers of E in the WHO uh, management of snake bite uh, 2016. Yeah? Um, so if let's say tonic K is not actually recommended, what are the recommended first aids for snake bite patients in Malaysia? Uh, it is all of these. So first of all, if the patient's actually uh, been bitten by a snake, uh, he or she uh, might uh, be assured and be calm because uh, uh, if let's say they are moving their hands or their limbs, uh, especially those bitten at the um, uh, 
apa ni uh, limbs ya so it can cause uh, movement when uh, the uh, when there's a movement of the muscle bulks it can cause increase of the uh, venom that spreading through a uh, lymphatic system number two is to move to the safe side and to reduce the physical movement rest immobilize and maintain immobilization with whatever immobilizer that can be available at that time okay and if let's say the patient been sprayed uh, onto the eye or eyes um, irrigation with copious amount of clean water uh, can be done before going to the hospital and so does for the irrigation of the wound okay Remove the jewelry and loose the tight clothes uh, because if let's say the patient is being bitten by the finger um, or toes uh, with the ring uh, on top of it, so it can cause a secondary or other injuries. Uh, for example, the, the, the trapping of the ring that uh, might be difficult to uh, take out later on. And after that, uh, arrange or go to the hospital as soon as possible. So when the patient was under us, uh, when the patient uh, is under us, so what are we supposed to do? So we should actually uh, assess uh, after stabilization, we should assess uh, for the uh, systemic symptoms, whether there's any systemic science symptoms, whether there's any uh, local science symptoms and the progression of the uh, science symptoms and uh, doing civil blood investigations. Okay, so with regards to the local symptoms, uh, the most important things for us um, in order uh, for us to assess is the pain score progression, especially uh, those patients bitten uh, by cobras and also pit vipers uh, that can cause uh, um, severe painful swelling. Uh, so assessing the pain score progression is needed and to assess the rate of proximal progression of the swelling is also very important. Uh, it can determine uh, with other parameters the indication whether to give antivenom or not. And if there is any necrosis, or even if there's no necrosis at all initially, uh, we need to assess back the bite marks uh, for any necrosis or uh, bullet formation. Uh, if possible, uh, the treating physician should have or should obtain consent from the patient uh, and take uh, good uh, pictures with good lightings uh, to assess whether the necrosis had been expanded or not. And also to assess the patient neurovascular status of the limb. Right? and also the leaf node, whether there's any tender leaf node or not. And assess also for the systemic uh, worsening of the neurotoxicity, worsening of the myotoxicity, and uh, whether the patient hemodynamic is unstable or um, if the patient is having any bleeding tendencies in the ward. And for blood investigation, it doesn't mean that uh, you have to do all the, for example, coagulation and also CK every six hours uh, for every patient that's been bitten for any species. Okay? Particularly if we already know that, uh, for example, patient is being bitten by a cobra, probably your CK and also a full blood count and uh, renal profile, uh, you can do it daily rather than six hourly. Okay? So there are reasons why uh, we did um, blood investigation and what uh, blood investigation that we want to do, uh, we want to do uh, on, on a patient. Yeah? So when uh, we assess, we document in the uh, snake bite charting. So if we know this is the recommended snake bite charting for us uh, in Malaysia, uh, on top of it, we have got the uh, par clinical parameters and the lower one is the laboratory parameters. So from this uh, charting, if you do it correctly, uh, we may actually um, determine whether the patient is in need of uh, antivenom or not. Of course, it is together with other things like assessing the severity of neurotoxicity, uh, uh, bleeding tendencies as well yeah so the next image is that um how uh, we do the rate of proximal progression of the swelling measurement so uh, we call it a rate because we measure the uh, the swelling uh, over time 
period. So uh, most of the time for us practitioners in the emergency departments or in the ward, um, uh, we tend to actually dash uh, when, when uh, in the uh, snake bite chart ni, normally we'll just put dash over here. I'm not sure because there's uh, the RPP is zero or because uh, the uh, ni, uh, healthcare worker do not know how to actually measure. Lah. Because uh, this uh, for us is actually uh, the parameters is one of the thing to help us in order for for the determination whether antivenom is uh, needed or not. Okay, so we uh, will have a look at what are the antivenoms available uh, in Malaysia. Antivenom is uh, introduced uh, by Albert Kermet in uh, Saigon in 1890s. It is an immunoglobulin, okay, purified from the plasma of a horse uh, nowadays. And uh, whether uh, the plasma of a horse is being immunized uh, with uh, only uh, one venom, uh, that becoming monovalent antivenom, or uh, immunized by more species of snakes that are becoming polyvalent. Okay, so uh, we have the antivenom. So we must have the indication to give antivenoms, okay? Giving antivenoms is not without indication. So there are three locals and six um, uh, systemic and venoming indications that well written uh, in the guideline uh, in the WHO or in our Malaysian guideline as well, right? So um, generally, for systemic and venoming, if the patient is having hemostatic abnormalities, neurotoxic signs, cardiovascular abnormalities, AKI, or hemoglobin myoglobinuria, or other evidence of intravascular hemolysis, the patient might be indicated to be given antivenom. For local envenoming, the indications are local swelling involving more than half of the bitten limb, rapid extension of swelling, and development of enlarged tender lymph node. But uh, having said that, as I said again, uh, because local envenoming me is the one that uh, uh, people ask uh, closely uh, every time. Uh, rate yang macam mana yang kita uh, nak bagi antivenom? Uh, rate uh, 0 0.5 cm per hour ke? 1 cm per hour ke? So the, the, the answer is that you must actually uh, take into consideration of uh, all the parameters that we measured just now with other uh, systemic envenoming, whether it's uh, present or not. Because you cannot actually interpret only one parameters uh, for you to decide to give the antivenom, okay? Right, so these are the antivenom that we have uh, in Malaysia. Uh, the above one is the monovalent antivenom. We have got uh, Najah Kauti antivenom, Ophiophagus Hana antivenom, uh, Kalos Dasmarodostoma or Malayan Pit Viper antivenom and Green Pit Viper antivenom. This is all monovalent uh, from QSMI, Thailand. And we also have got uh, polyvalent over here, neuropolyvalent, and also hematopolyvalent, also from QSMI Thailand, right? So uh, here is a bit different. We have got monovalent, which is anhydrina schistosa C snake antivenom, uh, derived from E schistosa. But uh, this monovalent antivenom is a bit special because uh, it can be used for all C snakes and venomation. And uh, over the lower most part uh, at the right region, um, this is the old antivenom uh, that have been used in Malaysia uh, way back uh, 20 years ago, the snake antivenom polyvalent uh, from India that uh, we never actually imported it nowadays okay, because of the poor or no cross at all. Okay, when we want to give antivenom, uh, be reminded that um, there are uh, first those uh, and the subsequent dose uh, regime that we need to follow. So first dose doesn't necessarily mean uh, you only give uh, one vial. First dose means that um, we want to give the first dose of how many vials, okay? So uh, we have got this regime. Uh, um, so let's say uh, the patient being bitten by a monocle cobra or king cobra with system and reanimation, normally we will just give 10 vials. Uh, it is the way of how uh, we would dilute uh, the uh, ni, the antivenom that is differs uh, from center to center. Okay, I, I believe that, uh, for example, in Klang Valley, the methods of giving antivenom is quite different compared to others. Yeah, uh, so so uh, as long as uh, you give the appropriate antivenom, uh, and you assess, and if the patient is still indicated, and you give, uh, so I think for me it's still okay, right? Uh, for example, for 
if you have got if we have got Malayan crate or banded crate, the first vial would be of uh, five vials of uh, apa ni, uh, Malayan crate or banded crate antivenom. And so that's for other uh, antivenom that is available. Okay. Right. So um, uh, apa ni, a bit of caveat. The dose for adults and pediatrics uh, patient being bitten by snake bite, if we want to give the antivenom, it will be of the same dose. And the dilution uh, for pediatric uh, population, uh, the dilution is uh, 5 to 10 mils per kilo. So you want to, for example, you want to give uh, 5 uh, vials of uh, antivenom, you dilute it in 5 to 10 mils of the normosanine uh, according to the kilo body weight. And uh, we must actually bear in mind uh, not uh, to give subcutaneous test dose, rather we will start with a slow IV infusion rate. And once we have started the antivenom, uh, we must observe for the response reaction and uh, to decide if the next dose of antivenom is needed. So this is a bit about venom of thalmia. Uh, venom of thalmia, uh, actually, uh, the problem lies between a spring of venom of, uh, from, majority is from Naja Sumatrana or spitting cobra. So uh, when the patient is spat or sprayed with uh, venom, so uh, it can cause uh, bifurcal spasms, uh, pain, uh, and um, so far from the documentation, uh, there's no spread to systemic uh, apa ni, uh, neurotoxicity. Uh, if let's say there's no laceration wounds uh, in the uh, apa ni, on the leads or uh, nearby uh, ni region. Ni. So uh, the first aid ataupun uh, the treatment would be urgent decontamination with copious irrigations of uh, described as up to 10 liter of normosanine. However, topical or IV antivenom uh, has no benefit lah, uh, so far in the literature. So let us go deeper with regards to the neurotoxicity. Okay. Uh, so we will go deeper into the Elapide uh, group species. So um, this uh, is actually a pictures that uh, I've taken from our books in the Lens Snakes of Medical Significance in Malaysia, third edition, published in early 2022 and uh, being, comp uh, being uh, produced by uh, uh, Professor Madia uh, Dr. Ahmad Khaldun Ismail, uh, uh, Mr. Vin, uh, Dr. Vince, uh, Prof. Indrajin Das, uh, uh, Dr. Taksa and uh, Prof. Scott from Australia. So, so um, we have got ELAPD uh, The way that I remember is that I remember as 4C, uh, the uh, crates, the four brass, the, the upper, uh, Apa ni? Uh, coral snakes and also the sea snakes. Okay, so um, in Malaysia we have got uh, bungarus uh, candidus. We have got uh, uh, bungarus facetus candidus and also flaviceps. Um, so if you see the elapidae snakes ni, uh, the snakes is usually uh, round in shape. Um, and also, um, they have got, uh, apa ni, um, when we see on top of the snake's head, uh, the, the punya, apa mengi, um, the punya, you can see the sisik dia is much more bigger on top of the, uh, snake's head, right? And, uh, for the, apa ni, bongarus or crates kan, dia biasanya, uh, the mouth is usually small, uh, similar for the sea snake as well. Okay, so, um, the lower part, we have got our famous Naja Kautia or Monaco Cobra, uh, Naja Sumatrana, and also uh, Ophiophagus Hana or King Cobra. The morphology might be different when they are uh, juvenile state. So if let's say you have got cases and you are unsure what are the snake species that is involved, uh, so you can actually ask the uh, experts lah, or clinical toxicologists to verify. Even we cannot verify, actually, we have the help uh, from our hepatologists as well. Okay, for next, we also have got cases being bitten by a Calliophis bivigatus or blue Malayan chorus snakes and also Calliophis intestinalis. You may see in the picture, uh, the snakes is uh, 
macam besar but actually it's just a small snakes that you can hold on your palm and uh, the next picture is the sea snakes uh, so this is the inheritance schistosis that we have the common uh, description of the sea snakes is that it has got a fin like tails and also cylindrical body uh, to make up to the snakes buoyancy uh, in the uh, water okay as we know uh, venom. Venom is a complex substance produced in a special gland. Uh, it's called venom gland of a venomous animal. And uh, usually venom is injected through a specialized apparatus to other living organisms. So ni, I think everyone uh, can understand it by now. Um, so for snake venoms per se, it is a diverse group of proteins with enzymatic activity. The major component, the major toxic components of venom have a molecular weight that is too large uh, to cross through the intact capillaries into the bloodstream. So therefore, uh, lymphatic drainage uh, is believed to be the main route. Because uh, sebab tu, um, uh, uh, if we recap back, uh, why we need the patients to be calm is because uh, we do not want the lymphatic drainage um, flow to be exaggerated when there's a muscle pumping. Okay, however, uh, damaged vasculature by the mechanical injury from the fangs may provide a faster route for spread, lah, especially if, let's say, the patient uh, bitten a patient and uh, accidentally, actually, it uh, it actually uh, puncture at the radial artery ke radial vein, for example. Yeah. Okay, so elapids venom particularly uh, contains of enzymes, proteins, and toxins. Right, so uh, for example, the phospholipase A2 enzyme, we call it as PLA2 enzyme, uh, uh, can cause multiple or varied actions that include cytotoxic, myotoxic, and or neurotoxic. Okay, so for polypeptide toxins, it may disrupt the neurotransmitter, uh, neuromuscular transmission or at the uh, NMG lah. And for the CTX or cytotoxicity, cardiotoxicity, uh, it can cause the myonecrosis or cardiotoxicity. And also we have got the uh, post uh, we have got the postsynaptic alpha or beta neurotoxins that is belongs to the three finger toxins that is subdivided into short and long chain. So um, for the neurotoxicity, sebenarnya, uh, the most common culprits is the uh, alpha and uh, beta neurotoxins lah, uh, helped by other. Uh, toxins or enzymes as well. But the other enzymes or toxin too uh, actually can exert other effect of the similar uh, snake species. Uh, like in uh, example, in this uh, uh, PowerPoint, we can see that even uh, if let's say we have got Naja Kaukia in Malaysia, the content is the same. But uh, when studies have been, has been made uh, with uh, other Naja species around the region, so we can see the component or composition of each of the enzymes or toxins are actually quite a bit of, uh, there's a difference over there, right? So that is the uh, uh, beautiful nature of the, uh, uh, the species that we have uh, with regards to the Naja species, for example. So the trajectory of the venom. When the snake venom be injected into human, it can particularly uh, either go to the targeted sites, remains uh, circulating uh, in the uh, bloodstream, or it acts as a depot until movement made by the patient. Uh, so this is particularly true in a pit viper species because of the uh, bigger molecular weight. So when the patient uh, actually uh, uh, rests in bed, so uh, the venom uh, doesn't circulate yet, but when the patient feels better, they uh, mobilize. Uh, so the venom starts to act as depot and uh, being circulated. When we talk about symptoms onset of neurotoxicity, uh, the true neurotoxicity, it can actually occur within minutes uh, and up to about four to seven hours. Uh, but it also depends on which elapids that been that bitten the patients and uh, uh, how long uh, are the elapids actually bitten the patient. So the duration of uh, patient being bitten, uh, one second, two second, ten second, and this uh, it does not depend on the snake's age, whether the snake is juvenile versus adult. Uh, in fact, actually, the juvenile snakes, uh, when it bites a patient, uh, they cannot control how much of volume of the venom uh, that 
been injected into the uh, human. And uh, usually, when we talk about uh, neurotoxicity, it starts with the small muscles uh, and uh, the most sinister event is the respiratory muscle paralysis. The pathophysiology of neurotoxicity, uh, actually, uh, we have got many. Uh, the majority that being documented is the blockage of the postsynaptic membrane of the NMJ that might be reversible with antivenom. The blockage of postsynaptic membrane of the NMJ, for example, uh, in our Naja species, Naja Sumatrana or Naja Kautia, and also uh, uh, King Cobra or of Afghanistan. So, uh, uh, venom in this species actually block uh, majority at the postsynaptic membrane. Uh, therefore, we can reverse it uh, with antivenom. And it also, the other part of physiology is lysis of the presynaptic follicles uh, containing acetylcholine with destruction of the presynaptic membrane of NMJ. So most of the time, uh, this uh, action or this uh, part of physiology is irreversible uh, if we give uh, antivenom quite late. Okay, uh, so example of uh, the venom that uh, act as this is actually venom of the uh, uh, crate. Although uh, for crate venom, it also has uh, got the pre and post uh, synaptic effect as well. So because of this, uh, it is assumed that the patient is having neurotoxicity of central in origin, but the truth it is uh, because of the profound paralysis that mimics coma. Um, that might also lead uh, into a condition of phenomenon that we call lock-in syndrome. So for postsynaptic membrane blockage, um, uh, it can also cause a fixed dilated pupils and can be mistaken by midbrain hypoxia. Uh, and other pathophysiology that uh, been described is that uh, the presence of cerebral hypoxia insult due to the hypotensive shock or intracranial bleeding or ischemic stroke. Uh, there is the sequelae of the um, apa ni, uh, toxicity from other uh, other uh, snake species, for example, the viperity and etc. Okay. So uh, whether the paralysis is ascending or descending, uh, it is uh, always it is actually described as descending in nature. Uh, why it is descending in nature is because um, uh, when the muscle is paralyzed, it will target the, the venom will target the small muscle first, uh, then only the limb weaknesses and also respiratory muscle uh, weakness uh, is the sequelae. So what we will see. Uh, if uh, the patient is in respiratory muscle uh, paralysis, whether the patient will hyperventilate or hypoventilate. Majority of the time, if we ask the MO, they, they will actually uh, check up, uh, oh, if the patient to the respiratory muscle paralysis, the, the patient will hyperventilate. So it's not, it's usually be hyperventilate. But if the patient is having hypoxia, when the SpO2 is dropping further, so the patient will be very restless. Uh, so uh, what we will do, uh, if the SpO2 drop, so uh, should we give oxygen and observe? If the oxygen pick up to 100%, can we keep calm and see another resus patient? In fact, actually, when the SpO2 drop, there is the red flags uh, saying that, yes, this patient might be having a respiratory muscle paralysis and currently in a hypoxia state that we need to act. Okay. So uh, Chadwick et al. had described the common neurological manifestation in decreasing order of frequency that includes pertosis, the most common one I encountered, ophthalmoplegia, limb weakness, respiratory failure, palatal weakness, and also neck muscle weakness in 7.1% of the cases. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, famous question that being asked is that can the venom cross the blood brain barrier? So, because the venom actually has a molecular weight that's big that cannot actually cross the blood brain barrier, uh, um, a few of case reports had been searched. So, uh, for example, in these case reports, uh, snake bite induced leukoencephalopathy uh, actually uh, been written by our colleagues from India. It is said. Uh, they describe a patient, a uh, 40-year-old uh, woman that had been bitten by a snake uh, and the patient become unconscious. Uh, and then uh, and polyvalent was given uh, to the patient and uh, MRI uh, brain uh, was done to the patient as well. So in the MRI, uh, uh, they found some interesting uh, 
findings lah. So what they found is that um, uh, they found out the signal intensity alteration in the caudate nuclei, denticular nuclei, and the thalamus uh, alongside with involvement of the cortical rim that suggests of an asymmetrical leukal encephalopathy. And when they do a DWI, uh, uh, it is not really suggestive of stroke. Uh, when they did a CSF examination, it is normal and negative for other viral markers. So this is the example of the MRI of brain that uh, we can see uh, there's uh, changes over the um, basal ganglia uh, and also the left uh, part of the cortical rims and does not actually reflect so much of the stroke from the uh, case reports. So in other case reports, it's also described uh, regarding the multi-system failure and death due to extensive hemorrhage in the brain and herniation subsequent to a bite by unidentified snake. But um, this case is actually described in Sri Lanka, uh, whereby a 52-year-old man uh, presented uh, with uh, coagulopathy, neurotoxicity, acute kidney injury, whereby in Sri Lanka, if the patient presented like this, normally they will suspect a uh, Daboya Raseli or Russell Speed Viper that can cause all this. Okay. So uh, the patient was given antivenom. However, the patient subsequently uh, developed uh, persistent neurotoxicity. They have done the CT uh, brain, and the CT brain reveals a uh, bleeding or intracerebral hemorrhage that extends to the intra intraventricular hemorrhage as well. And this is the PM or autopsy findings that they found. So what can the antivenom do? Uh, so the appropriate optimal antivenom can uh, reverse the postsynaptic blockage by binding to the toxin and it can bind to the circulating venom that can cause the venom effect. Uh, bear in mind that if we wrongly give the antivenom, it also, uh, or it's actually if appropriate antivenom also, it can cause an anaphylactic reaction uh, that includes life threatening event, more so if the wrong AV is given. Lah. So that's the double problem that the patient might have. Okay. Um, other ancillary treatment uh, can be used as well uh, for the patient that been bitten by snakes, uh, particularly in LAPD. Uh, good basic and advanced life support provision is very important. We have to maintain the airway. If you need to intubate, then you need to intubate and ventilate the patient and support the hemodynamics to make sure the patient is not having secondary effects such as hypoxia. Uh, you may want to give the tenus prophylaxis according to the guideline uh, with adequate energy seal, but try not to uh, try to avoid long acting opioids that might be masking the effects of neurotoxicity and um, to give broad spectrum antibiotics for manipulated wound or whether the whether there's any expanding demonic process or if the patient is in sepsis and treat anaphylactic or anaphylactoid infection as per protocol when uh, you've been given antivenom and regarding the acetylcholinesterase drugs, I will explain further. Okay, the trial of anticholinesterase drugs um, particularly uh, have a, a variable but potential uh, being useful, okay, especially in patients uh, that uh, uh, presented to us with neurotoxic and vietnamese. Uh, but uh, of course, this uh, will not replace uh, the antivenom therapy that uh, we want to give for the patient. Okay, this is just a supportive uh, uh, treatment, lah. Okay, and um, in other parts of the world, especially when the antivenom is not really available, if they got the drugs, uh, they can uh, buy time uh, by giving the drugs. Okay, so. Uh, recent claims uh, that intranasal neostatement uh, might provide a universal first aid method for snake bite victims knee. Uh, well, uh, is uh, uh, is uh, being uh, apa ni, uh, stated as unsubstantiated, misleading, and fanciful at the moment. So a lot of trial uh, need to be done. Lah. But basically. If let's say uh, you have got, uh, this is the um, uh, case scenario uh, that we have. Yeah? If let's say you have got a case uh, being bitten by a neurotoxic uh, snakes, for example, um, uh, crates, yeah? so you have given the first five vials of the uh, antivenom and um, uh, the patient, uh, you have given it early, uh, but the patient doesn't wake up yet. So uh, you may uh, want to uh, do this test, okay? Basically, the protocol is like this. Uh, one, obtain the baseline observation, 
uh, number two is to give the uh, atropine intravenously, okay, and then to give the anticholinesterase drugs, there is neostigmine, uh, and observe the effect. If, let's say, the effect is positive, to institute the regular atropine and neostigmine. So this is the guide that is published in the uh, uh, WHO guideline in 2016. How about the ISPEC test? I expect test is much more simpler to do. So basically, uh, in a patient with violent tropotosis, uh, we want to know whether there is a tropotosis or not. So uh, you can actually assess first the apony, uh, uh, apony assess first the um, distance of the palpable fissures uh, deep margin. Okay, using a millimeter ruler, and then uh, you uh, have to to press the frontalis muscle uh, to avoid it, uh, influencing the upper eyelid reaction that the patient might uh, need do. And then uh, just put a ice fill plastic glove or frozen ice pack for two minutes and then uh, measure back the distance of the palpable fissure. So kalau it is more than two millimeter difference, uh, so it means that the test is positive. So it can replace the tensilon test just now, right? So um, a few more slides to go. Uh, this is with regards to the lock-in lock syndrome phenomenon being described uh, by Professor Ahmad Khaldun and colleagues in one of the cases that they managed in uh, UKM. So uh, whereby a 30-year-old uh, Malay gentleman had been bitten by a confirmed king cobra and presented uh, with uh, neurotoxicity that requiring in total about 33 vials of uh, king cobra antivenom. So um, uh, the patient described uh, the the uh, the experience that uh, he had uh, when the patient is being intubated. So the patient is being intubated by the whip. So um, the moral story is that it is important to differentiate neurotoxic snake and venomation uh, lock-in syndrome from brain death because if the patient is in lock-in syndrome, so it can be mistaken from uh, with brain death. So um, whereby the patient are unable to respond to physical pain and uh, mimics the brain dead with uh, all the dilated pupils and everything. So if the patient is in lock-in syndrome, um, we must uh, make sure that the patient might be in pain and uh, might require adequate anesthesia. And also after, if the patient survived the phenomenon uh, being extubated, so uh, we might need to refer to the psychologist for psychological support as well. So last slides, uh, the cross neutrality of antivenom use in Malaysia. Uh, humongous studies have been done by researchers in Malaysia, mainly from the Faculty of Medicine UM, uh, regarding the cross neutrality of AV use in Malaysia. So for example, I give the example for elapid snakes, uh, Naja Kautia antivenom, it can be used for Naja Sumatrana with a good cross neutrality. However, uh, for Ophiopagus hana antivenom, it can't be used for Naja species because it is a totally different species, although they commonly call it as a uh, cobra species altogether. So neuropolyvalent AV can be used for Naja kausia, Ungarus, Candidus or Pasiatus, Ophiopagus hana because neuropolyvalent, it consists of the um, antivenom for these four species. But at the same time, we can also use for Naja Sumatrana and also Bungarus flaviceps, okay, um, and venomation as well. And for sea snakes, uh, it is derived from a monovalent from anhydrina schistosa, but it can be used for other sea snake and venomation as well, right? So this is the acknowledgement of uh, all the individuals that I want to acknowledge. Um, this is further information uh, from our website in the Malaysian Society on Toxinology. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabina, for the uh, informative talk. So I open to the floor for questions. We have one question from the chat box. Uh, do we have poisonous snakes in Malaysia? And any role for using HPAV for envenomation by Rhabdophis uh, uh, simensis, which is a redneck killback? For Rhabdophis, uh, uh, I I cannot remember uh, every answers. Tapi for rhabdophis uh, subminators, the uh, we 
can't really use the HPAV. So if we need to use, if we have a confirmed cases uh, case, then we have to import the antivenom uh, of Rhabdofis uh, uh, yeah, I cannot remember the, the name uh, from Japan. So uh, that is the uh, that have the cross neutrality with the Rhabdofis subminiatus in Malaysia. And do we have poisonous snakes in Malaysia? Venomous snakes so far, yes. Poisonous. Venomous snakes so far, yes. Uh, poisonous too, uh, not that I've encountered yet. Oh, I think this is a question from Dr. Amakadu because there's a lot of questions in the chat. Okay, any more questions uh, from the audience? Well, I think uh, in the chat box, uh, Dr. York uh, Blessman, uh, who is also a clinical toxinologist from uh, Germany, uh, that uh, have a vast experience actually managing cases in Laos as well, had responded uh, to the company uh, in the chat box. So please have a look. Okay, there's one question uh, by Margie. What's the difference between poisonous and venomous snakes? I think it's been answered by Prof. Kaldun uh, at the lower part of it. Basically, uh, for snakes, if let's say the venom um, toxin actually, uh, they have it in the venom gland and not at the other parts of the body, so we call it as a venomous snakes because um, um, the venom actually uh, is uh, at the location of the venom gland. But when we call it as poisonous, it as what Dr. Caldun said, actually, uh, uh, it is also a, a toxin that is present other than the venom gland. That is called a knuckle glands for cymosis. If uh, there's no further questions, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sabrina, and also uh, thank you, Dr. Suhailan.